ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القران المجيد بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد last week we spoke about الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات the importance of having these two qualities those who believe and those who act upon those uh, those beliefs those who have righteous actions what do we get what type of qualities do we develop when we implement this what we get is an ummah that is literate and an ummah that is brave why because alladhina amanu those who have faith what they have is they do research they learn they look into and they read about their beliefs so that they are their 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 beliefs are on a solid foundation that their iman is built upon solid knowledge so muslim a muslim should be the most literate of people the people who are the most interested in reading and the most interested in knowledge and books and so forth wa amilu salihat and then first after knowing the path you have to now walk the path these are the two qualities you have to have first i need to know the path I need to learn and study, have a knowledge foundation so that I know the path. Then I have to have the courage to walk the path. This is crucially important. This is completely 100% important for the believer. That is how we combine alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat. It is very unfortunate that we find in the ummah today some statistics say that Muslims are 40% illiterate in the whole Muslim world. They say in the ummah imagine Some statistics say to the point of even 40% illiteracy. That bad. And I would even add to that that of the Muslims that are literate, alhamdulillah, those of us who are blessed with the ability to read and maybe even in multiple langu- languages, alhamdulillah, unfortunately you find even those Muslims that have such a blessing don't use that blessing. They, they let it sit on the shelf. What would they rather do? Drown themselves in entertainment. Glued to the screen. Constantly absorbed. two shows music and movies and so on and so forth just constantly entertaining themselves instead of being people of literacy how can this be the case when we are ahlul iqra we are the people who when when the prophet sallam refers his re- received his first revelation it was iqra read that was the first word that was real to the prophet sallam this is the quality that the ummah should possess that being said that is not what i would like to focus on today what i want to focus on today is the other half literacy and what courage bravery what is bravery what is courage courage is the audacity and the firmness to remain patient and constant in standing for what is right and opposing what is wrong that is what courage is and that is what every single believer has to have and there are two kinds of courage two kinds of bravery one is in the military aspect which is defending against attacks from the outside and then there is defending on the inside and that is speaking the truth because when you have a society there can be an opposing military that comes in as an external threat you have to have the courage to defend yourself and that is through military however on the inside of that society there might be evil ideas that get spread lots of terrible trends and ideas and and the best way to defend against these bad ideas is to offer alternative ideas to demonstrate through words that you can expose the evils of those ideas and demonstrate what the truth is and that requires courage to stand up and speak the truth in front of an audience even if they don't want to hear it that requires courage so when it comes to the first kind of bravery the bravery in the battlefield as shuja al harbiya as is known in the arabic language 
We know that, the, uh, that Ali radiallahu anhu, he narrates what? لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنَا يَوْمَ بَدْرٍ وَنَحْنُ نَلُوذُ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. وَهُوَ أَقْرَبُنَا إِلَى الْعَدُوْ وَكَانَ مِنْ أَشَدِّ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ بَأْسًا We were taking protection around the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Badr. Why? Because he was the one who was the closest to the enemy and also the toughest against them. That the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated the most bravery. This, is, this was the quality, this was the legacy. When we say that we want to be upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, we need to recognize that bravery is a crucial uh, quality and characteristic of the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أحسن الناس وأجود الناس وأشجع الناس That the Prophet ﷺ was the most beautiful, was the, was the most beautiful of people. And also, أجود الناس, the most generous of people and أشجع الناس. The most brave. And then he goes on to narrate a, a beautiful narration, which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, where the people of Medina, they heard this loud clamoring, some sort of a noise, and they didn't know what that noise was. And so it was nighttime, it was dark. People started to get up and started to move towards that noise, trying to figure out what's happening. They weren't sure if perhaps the city was under attack. They didn't know what to think. And as they get closer to the noise, they see that the Prophet ﷺ is coming on a horse, and he's already coming back from whatever it was. He's already on his way back. And he's telling the people, don't worry, it's okay. It was just a horse that had gotten loose and that went a little crazy and started kicking things and you know, it started making lots of noise. It was just a horse and now we're taking care of it. So SubhanAllah, by the time that the people started to get themselves ready and muster the courage to go see what's happening in the middle of the night, in the middle of the dark, they find that the Prophet has already gotten up, already gotten on a horse with no saddle, rode out, checked what the problem was, Discover what the problem was, came back, let the people know what was happening. This is the bravery of the Prophet. You want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet? Ask yourself, when there is a something of danger, when there is some sort of fear, are you the first to get up and go check it out? Are you the first to put yourself on the line to defend those who are behind? Is this your quality or not? This is how we want to implement the Sunnah of the Prophet. When it comes to al-shuja'a al-adabiyya, bravery of character. Not from the enemy on the outside, but rather from the evils on the inside. The bravery and the courage to speak the truth, even if the people don't like it. We see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and informs us in the Qur'an, what? وَلَا تَكْتُمُوا الشَّهَادَةِ Don't conceal your testimony. This ayah is in reference to court, but it can be applied generally as well. That when you know you have to speak the truth, when you know what the right thing is, and when you know when your words will be of benefit, don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid to speak the truth and to let everybody know exactly what they need to hear. Don't conceal your testimony. You can't be that way. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa commands you to have the courage to speak the truth. And the Prophet says, Man ra'a minkum munkaran, fal yughayyirhu bi yadihi, wa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi, wa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi, wa thalika adha'afu al-iman. Famous hadith in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet says, What? He who amongst you sees something that is evil, should change it with his hand. That is referring to the first kind of bravery. And if you cannot do that, then change it with your tongue, speak against it. That is the second kind of bravery. And if you cannot do that, then at least hate it in your heart, and that is the weakest of faith. Nobody wants to be characterized as the weakest. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says to themselves, you know what I want to be? I want to be the weakest in life. That is not an admirable position. What we want is to be the best. We want to aim high in life. So what does that mean? You, that means you have to develop the courage and the bravery when you see something evil that you jump into action and you try to stop it. You try to stop that evil from taking place. And if for whatever reason you are incapable of doing so, then at least, at the very least, don't be afraid of speaking the truth. This doesn't mean that you have to be harsh. This doesn't mean that you have to be rude. It means that you have to be brave and you have to be intelligent, not run by emotions. Not overcome by passions and just blurting out whatever comes to mind, but thinking before you talk. Considering the best words, but indeed speaking, saying what is true. The Prophet ﷺ says, That the best type of struggle, the best type of struggle for the sake of Allah is what? A, a, a just word, a true word in front of an unjust tyrant, an evil ruler. Why is that the case? Because everyone knows that the evil ruler can simply just do a quick flick of the hand and you will be taken care of, you will disappear, and no one will ever see you again. So how much bravery does it take to speak that truth? This is what our deen teaches us. And if that is the case when it comes to an unjust ruler, 
then what about within our own families? What about within our own communities? What about within the masjid and amongst our friends? How is it possible that we can be so cowardly not to speak to our own friends and give advice when necessary? How is it possible that we don't possess that courage if we are supposed to be the ummah that listens to the Prophet and implements this even in the scariest of scenarios? We need to really assess this, this, this reality. The Prophet also says in uh, Sahih ibn Hibban, قُلِ الْحَقُّ وَلَوْ كَانَ مُرًّا Speak the truth even if it's bitter. It's not a popularity contest. In life, you can't please everybody. That will never be the case. You can never make everybody happy. You need to drop that idea, drop that as a goal because you will never achieve that goal. You need to realize that the only person that is deserved, that is, that is worthy of being pleased is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going to speak the truth whether you like it or not. I'm going to speak the truth even if it is bitter. Those who love it can love it. Those who hate it can hate it. And I do not fear the blame of the blamers. That's, you know, there's always going to be haters in life. There's always going to be those people who are critical no matter what you do. Some people, they get up in the morning, they only have one intention. How can I be critical of anybody trying to do something good? Some people, that's, that's, that's their only fuel. They don't have any goals of themselves, they just want to put down everybody else's goals. So don't worry about these type of people. Don't worry about the critics. People will, oh, everybody's a critic. Everybody's always criticizing. But those who actually stand up and speak the truth, they are accountable not before the people, they are accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to have that courage. Now, this brings us, inshallah, to the next question, a very important question, which is, well, actually, just a quick quote, a very important quote, which says, evil prevails when good men do nothing. It's a very powerful quote, a very powerful proverb in the English language. Evil prevails when good men do nothing. And that is absolutely true. And you can extend that as well and say, evil prevails when good men say nothing. I think that's also applicable. So, when you see evil prevailing, ask yourself, am I a good man? Have I done anything to stop this? Have I said anything to stop this? If not, then I am at fault as well. I am part of the problem, I am not part of the solution. And inshallah, we will talk in the second khutbah about how we as parents can foster these qualities within our children, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam, 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 Bismillah walhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Fostering courage, developing and nurturing courage and bravery in our children is a necessity amongst all of us as parents. It is our duty. Now I did start by talking about the importance of education and courage. And I just think it's very important to note that when it comes to education, every parent is so adamant. Every parent, walhamdulillah, loves to foster education in their children. That's a natural quality. And it's a beautiful quality to constantly push your children in terms of education. Unfortunately, you don't find the pairing of the two. What you find is a bit of an imbalance. You want them to be knowledgeable, but when it comes to encouraging your children to be tough and pushing your children towards toughness and bravery, you find that most parents, they pull back. Why? Because they don't want their precious little angel to get a bruise. They don't want their precious little angel to get a scrape on their knee. They don't want them to get even the slightest pain. And on the one hand, of course, that's natural. As parents, you want, you want to protect your children. It's natural. It's a natural feeling. It's a beautiful feeling. However, we have to recognize the danger of overprotective parenting, of coddling your child, of what's known as helicopter parenting, constantly hovering around them and making sure that they are protected from every little thing. Do we as parents ever consider the danger by overprotecting our children, usually we do not. Usually we think of the other side of the pendulum, but we don't think of the, uh, when the pendulum swings too far to the other side. Because the child, what happens to this child, they develop a dependency. And they unfortunately, eventually cannot cope with the challenges of the real world. That's a very dangerous thing. You are actually sending your child into this world with a handicap, with a cripple, because you have overly protected them and coddled them. Intelligence, when you foster this intelligence in the child, that's a good thing. But intelligence without courage is actually a dangerous combination. Because the smart child, who is also cowardly, can always come up with clever ways and intelligent ways why to justify his cowardice. This happens a lot. And this is actually the, the danger of any type of ilm. 
Even scholars, when people study Islam and become knowledgeable in Islam, the big danger is what? That they're going to use that knowledge to justify whatever they want. This is a very dangerous thing. So, so when you, as a parent, only focus on the child's intelligence and you don't couple that with courage, you can create a very dangerous combination. In your attempt to protect them, you undermine them. And in fact, what you create, what you, what you raise up, is an old infant. And there's nothing worse in life than a man-child. There's nothing worse than an old infant. And subhanAllah, we are finding in society, this is becoming much more prevalent. And many people, they, 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 they hypothesize that the reason why we're finding more and more of this man-child uh, phenomenon is because people are having less and less children. When you have 10 children, you can't helicopter parent each child, naturally, it's impossible, it's just too much work. But when you have only one or two children, then it's the natural tendency to be overprotective for that one or two children. And then, so, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a naturally good desire to have, but the unfortunate consequence is that child becomes coddled, they become weaker. Because what happens to this child? They, they develop a shorter temper. You'll find that children that are coddled, they usually have more anxiety. Why? Because they're used to everything going their way. So when they go out into the real world and things don't go their way, they don't know how to handle it. They have shorter tempers, they have more anxiety, they don't know how to deal with reality. It makes them less sociable, it makes them less mature, it makes them more entitled, and also it makes them less capable of making decisions. You should have, you should develop, train in your child the ability to make independent decisions. It's a very important quality that each child should have. I'll give you all a case study so you know exactly what I'm talking about, just to, to give you a simple example. Imagine your child, let's say in the late teens, comes up to you and says, I want to spend this weekend out with my friends, and let's say they're good friends in child. Good, they have good friends. I want to go out with my friends for the weekend and go hiking, you know, camping or something like this. The natural instinct of most parents is to start listing all the potential dangers, right? That's what most parents, it's the natural instinct. You start thinking, what if they get hurt? What if there's a dangerous animal? What if they get sick? What if they get lost? What if, what if, what if, what if? And you start listing all these potential negatives. And then all of those potential fears, they start to build up in your mind and they become overwhelming and you say, no, I don't want you to do it. Unfortunately, what doesn't happen in the, in the, in the mind of the parent is they often don't think about the other side of the equation. Which is what? What if my child, instead of going out this weekend, spends the weekend in the basement? Again, weekend after weekend, in the basement, again and again, in front of the screen, playing video games, again and again. You don't think about the danger in that. You don't think about what type of friends they're going to develop. How they're not going to have any courage, how they're not going to have any, uh, uh, they're, 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 they've never gotten out of their little bubble. They've always played it so safe. They've always had mommy and daddy protecting them from everything. You don't think about that. So we always have to think of both sides of the equation. Yes, there are dangers outside, but there are dangers inside as well. And they creep up on you slower. But when they actually, when, when, as they creep up and as they develop, eventually they're so bad you can't get rid of them. Because now the child, like I said, is an old infant. They have no skills. And they can't deal and cope with the real world. And imagine if this person now marries somebody and is now responsible for a family. They can't handle that as well. And that's why one of the, one of the, one of the hy hypotheses is this is why we are seeing such high divorce rates. Because people are getting married and they have no maturity. They're two, they're, they're two people trying to act like adults that are both big babies, big children. And they can't handle, therefore, the responsibility of dealing with the family. There's another danger. There's a very famous expression, overprotective parents raise the best liars. I don't know if you've heard this expression before. Overprotective parents raise the best liars. What does that mean? It's human nature to, to want a little bit of independence, to get away from your parents. And when parents coddle the children and keep them so tight, the, the children develop a very intelligent, intelligent ways to deceive the parents, to get around the parents. And so they, they basically raise really good liars, really smart kids that know how to deceive. So what's much healthier instead is to give the child some independence. Let them make their own decisions. Why? Because then the consequences of their actions are actually meaningful. If you're overprotecting your child and he has a victory, it's not really his victory because you were the one that was involved in every step of the way. And if he has a failure, it's not really his failure because you were involved every step of the way. However, if you give that child some independence, now when that child has a victory, it means something. That was your victory. You made the decision to go forward, you went forward, you trained yourself, it was your victory, good job. It means something. And when they fail, it was your failure. 
Why? I let you make your own decision. You went forward, you tried it out, you failed, you can learn from that failure. So independence has its benefits, but if you take that, if you rob the child of that independence, the victories are meaningless, the failures are meaningless, they never develop, they just remain big babies. How can we foster this courage within our children? As parents, if you're wondering, well, how can I foster these qualities? There's a few ways, perhaps four ways we'll talk about. Number one, train them. Train your children. Why? Because the more you train your child, the more confidence they will have. Obviously, if you're put into a situation that you have no knowledge of, you will feel very intimidated. But if you train for that moment, just to say, you know, going into battle, if, you've trained, if you're a trained warrior, now when you go into battle, you have confidence. So you should physically train your child so that if they ever do have a physical confrontation, they have the confidence to defend themselves. If they are ever in a verbal spat, if they ever have to defend themselves mentally, they know how to defend their beliefs and defend their views. Why? Because you've mentally trained them, you made them intelligent. And also financially, you've taught them to be financially smart, good with money, so that when a rainy day comes, they are ready for that. Train them. Train your children that will, inshallah, foster and develop courage. Allah SWT tells us in the Quran, وَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَى And prepare against, whatever, uh, prepare against them whatever you can of your quwa, of your power. In other words, Allah is teaching us what? Always be ready. Prepare yourself in case of any sort of uh, danger. And this is particularly speaking about militarily, but it applies generally as well. The Prophet ﷺ says, That the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak believer, and in both of them there is good. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us, be strong, develop your strength. Why? Because it will develop that courage as well. Number two, knowing the consequences. Knowing the consequences of not being brave. Because we know that evil will continuously spread and that evil will eventually affect you. Allah SWT says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ In one ayah, أُولَٰئِكَ مُلْفَاسِقُونَ In another ayah, and kafirun In another ayah. Allah says what? That and whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those people who are the wrongdoers, those who are defiantly disobedient. What, what is this talking about? This is mentioning the fact that SubhanAllah, the more that you let evil become widespread and you never stop it and you never try to implement Allah's guidance and revelation, that evil will become so widespread that it will eventually harm you. So even out of your own self-interest, you have to speak the truth and you have to be courageous. Number three, train them through generosity. Imam al-Dhahabi, he says, Rahimahullah, he has a very famous, a very beautiful quote. He says, Al-Shuja'a wa sakha akhawan. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجُدْ بِمَانِهِ فَلَنْ يَجُودَ بِنَفْسِهِ That bravery and generosity are brothers, as in they're related. Bravery and generosity, they're connected. They have a relationship with one another. Whoever isn't generous with money won't be generous with himself. In other words, you have to train yourself to be generous with your money. And then inshallah you'll have the bravery when the time comes to be generous with even your own self. If you never train yourself to be generous with your money, what chance is there that you're actually going to put yourself on the line? You weren't even willing to put $5 on the line. You're going to not put yourself on the line? Impossible. So train ourselves, train our children to be brave through training them to be generous. And fourthly, remember that ultimately your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Nisa describes a situation where the believers are fighting against the disbelievers and that the believers are losing heart. And they're thinking to themselves that, you know, we're injured and we're hurting and things are difficult. And Allah reminds them, Do not weaken. Do not weaken in your pursuit of the enemy. If you should be suffering, they are also suffering. But you expect from Allah that which they do not expect. So Allah is saying, look, in this dunya, sure, you might go through hardship. You might be brave and you might get injured because of it. You might be brave and you might suffer financially because of it. You might be brave and you might go through many consequences as a result of that. But guess what? Ultimately your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are faced with the enemy and both of you get hurt, and both of you uh, suffer any sort of consequences, it may be equal, it may, see, it may seem even, but it is not even because they are fighting fi sabili shaitan, you are fighting fi sabili Allah. You have to know that ultimately your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, if we can try to always remember these uh, four points to foster in our children, train them to get them ready for that danger, to get them ready for, the, for that rainy day, that will make them uh, courageous. Number two, 
knowing the consequences of, be, uh, of not being brave, knowing that as a consequence, evil will be widespread and it will come back to you eventually anyhow. Number three, train them through being generous with their wealth and inshallah they will be ready when the time comes to be generous with themselves as well. And number four, that knowing that your reward is ultimately with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to remind everybody of a very beautiful quote. Some say it's from Aristotle, I don't know the true authenticity of that, but it's a nice quote anyhow. It's a nice quote that says, Courage is the midpoint between cowardice and recklessness. So nobody is, is saying that you should be reckless and putting your child in unnecessary danger. Recklessness, recklessness is not courage. But at the other end, the other extreme is cowardice. So you have to always look at these two extremes, cowardice and recklessness, and say, I don't want to be on either extreme. I don't want to throw myself out there and say I have to be brave and do something that is just ridiculous and, and, and putting myself on the line for no reason. No, that's recklessness. At the same time, I don't want to be so scared and so cautious that I never stand up for the truth. I have to be between those two points. And that midpoint is called courage. It's called bravery. Because bravery is the midpoint between cowardice and recklessness. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت ربنا آتنا في دنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا آتنا في دنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سلم كثيرا وأقم الصلاة